Welcome to APCUG's Wednesday Workshops, where we get together in the middle of the week to learn more about technology. It's October. Some places it's warm, some places it might be cold. But in all places, October is Cybersecurity Month. And we've been focusing on workshops that are to help you with the battle against the security issues. We're so pleased to have back with us one of our often regulars, Joe Kissel. He's a best-selling author and technologist known primarily in recent years for writing about Apple devices and other high-tech topics. Regardless of the subject matter or the medium, he enjoys taking complicated topics, researching them thoroughly, and explaining them to in simple terms. Nearly anyone can understand what he is trying to say. In 2017, he also became the owner and publisher of Take Control Books, which means spending much more time doing editing and busyness things, and much less time actually writing. He has written 58 different Take Control books and updated many just this year. And I'll say that if you get one of his books, and he updates it, you'll get a notification that you get the updated version for free. Among other hats that Joe wears are dad, husband, editor, computer geek cook, punster, amateur scientist, storyteller, martial artist, and dreamer. He likes to think of himself as a generalist rather than a specialist. Joe lived in Paris, that was new to me, from 2007 to 2012, and then from 12 to 21, he lived in San Diego, but now resides in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada, with his wife, Morgan Jenke, and their son, Soren and Devin. His 31-year-old son, Ben, lives in Oregon. Joe is with us today, again, to try to help us take control of something, and today it's take control of your privacy. So I'm going to turn things over to Joe and help us. It's a nasty world out there, Joe. It is. Uh, and I will I will try to help keep you a little bit safer. Uh, so hi, everyone. As you were just reading that, uh, that lovely description, I was realizing, oh, uh, that must have been from a few years ago. A few, few things are going to need to be updated, like uh, well over 60 books now. A 31-year-old, 33, stuff like that. Uh, we'll talk about that another time. Anyway, as I was telling um, the folks who were uh, here before we started rolling uh, for real, uh, I woke up with a sore throat this morning. Um, my voice is not at its best, so I might have to take a couple of breaks, clear my throat, drink some water, have a little bit of honey, uh, but we will we will power through this as best we can. So uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Let's get this going. And uh, I am going to begin as, as things always begin in the 21st century with a commercial. So as, as you heard, I run a publishing company called Take Control Books. We sell eBooks on a wide variety of tech topics. Uh, some of them are Apple specific. What we're gonna be talking about today is not. And they're available in both PDF form and EPUB form. You can read them on basically any modern device. And uh, you see that, uh, that discount code there. I mean, you wanna make a note of that. This is just for user group members like you. You can put anything you want in your shopping cart, uh, paste or type that coupon code into the uh, field on the cart page and apply the coupon, and then you will save 30% on any purchase. And you can keep using that over and over again. I hope you will take advantage of it and buy 30% more books or whatever. So all of our stuff is at takecontrolbooks.com. Please check us out. Now, today our topic is online privacy. And I just want to give you a little quick overview of where we're going. Uh, now, when I 
first wrote my book about online privacy, this was a number of years ago. It's been gone through several new editions since then. Uh, a friend of mine who is a, a computer geek said, wow, that's going to be a short book. Uh, that was his way of saying online privacy. You've got to be kidding. There is no such thing. And you know what? There is something to that. Online privacy is very, very hard to achieve. Not only is it hard, but it's a moving target. So I could tell you, like, you know, we could sit down together and go over every setting in every app on every device you have and get to a point where your privacy is in pretty good shape right now. And then tomorrow, somebody changes something. Google or Microsoft or Facebook or whoever makes a change on their website, they make a change to an app, a new version of an operating system comes out. Sometimes these things make your privacy better. More often than not, they make them worse. So we're not talking about a set it and forget it kind of thing. We're talking about kind of learning what the threats are what you need to be paying attention to as time goes on so that you can keep coming back and making more changes as necessary to adapt to changing conditions out there on the internet. Now, <laughs> I've, I've given versions of this presentation, I can't even tell you how many dozens of times to thousands of people, and I've you know, written books on this topic, and I've gotten a lot of feedback by email. I've talked to a lot of folks about this. And there are a lot of people out there who have this idea that if they just do all the right things, that all the stuff that they do online will be perfectly, completely private. And uh, it won't be. Sorry, but also you really don't want it to be. Now, as I'm just doing my thing, you know, like I'll, uh, I'll pick up my phone, open it up and see what the weather is like. And if I happen to be traveling, I can go to the weather app and see what the weather is gonna be like wherever I am. If I want to uh, order some food, I can go to any of numerous apps and they'll figure out where I am, just like the weather app figures out where I am and gives me the appropriate information for I don't wanna see restaurants in New York if I'm in San Diego, right? So awareness of your location is an example of one of the many, many, many things that you are potentially advertising as you use your digital devices. You could turn that off, but if you turn it off, there will be consequences that you might not like. You're in an accident or you have some kind of emergency. It'd be really great for the people that are coming to help you to know exactly where you are. But if you've turned off that location stuff, they won't. So what I'm saying is, and I'm just using location as an example, I could have mentioned any of numerous other things. Privacy cuts both ways. The things that help to keep you safe by, you know, preventing other people from knowing about them can also keep you less safe if the people who need to know about them don't know. And they can also cause you inconvenience. Do you have, do you want to have to enter the name of your city every time you look up something local? I, I would rather not. So it's, a matter of trade-offs. You get to decide what kinds of information you really, really, really have to keep private, what kinds of information you only want to keep private in certain contexts or from certain people, and what kinds of information you feel okay sharing because the benefits outweigh the risks. We'll get into all this in a minute. Despite the challenges and the changing landscape and the fact that there are all these trade-offs. Ordinary folks like you and me can still have pretty good safety against the biggest privacy threats. And I and I use those words like stick in ordinary folks with ordinary privacy needs and the biggest privacy threats. I put in all those adjectives quite deliberately 
because we are not talking about going off and living in a cave someplace with no internet and no phone and nobody knowing where you are. We're talking about continuing to interact with our friends and family and the real world, but locking things down as best we can to deal with the biggest threats. In my experience, having talked to many, many, many people about this subject, and I see it almost every time I do a presentation like this and there's questions at the end and somebody's like, okay, so, so Joe, I do this, this, and this, and I, I often, often, often find that people are worried about the wrong things, which is to say there's something that they're really, really worried about that they don't have to be. But on the other hand, there's something they really aren't worried about at all that they should be. So uh, toward the end of this talk, I'm going to be discussing that in more detail. I want you to not be paranoid. I want you to not live in a state of fear, being afraid to ever log into your computer or turn on your phone because the bad guys might do something bad to you. But I do want you to pay attention to some things that you maybe aren't right now. I also want to say a few more words about that ordinary people with ordinary privacy needs stuff. So I, I wrote this, the book that this talk is based on for people like you and me, for people like my mom, for people like my neighbor. I did not write this book for Edward Snowden. I did not write this book for spies, politicians, celebrities, people with billions of dollars. I did not write this book for people with, you know, trying to protect state secrets or something very, very, uh, th something that makes them quite a target. If the people in this building, this is for those of you who don't recognize it, the NSA headquarters in Fort Meade, Maryland. Uh, if these kinds of people are interested in you, you need more help than I can give you. I'm going to guess that's probably not true of anyone here, but I'm just saying there is a level, the, the level at which we are talking about online privacy is kind of ordinary folks. If you win the lottery tomorrow, and by the way, uh, that would be awesome, and I hope you share some of your winnings with me, you're going to have a target painted on your back. If something very, very good happens to you or something very, very bad happens to you, all of a sudden you might get a lot more interest by people, companies, governments, grifters, whatever, people who are, are now suddenly very interested in your private data. And you are going to need a greater level of help but still, I hope that some of the principles I talk about today uh, could be useful even in those situations. Now, I want to make it clear that there are three related but different concepts when it comes to privacy. Privacy, of course, is when you can do what you do without other people seeing that, hearing it, paying attention to it. So that's pretty easy. But then we also talk about security. And there is a relationship between privacy and security, but they're not the same thing. A lot of the things that you can do to keep your data free from danger or from harm, keep yourself physically free from danger, free from harm, will also keep your online interactions out of other people's view. So some of the security measures you can take will protect your privacy as well. And it also goes in the other direction. But there is, there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence there. And then there's this third term, anonymity. A lot of people think that by turning up all their privacy controls in the various devices, that means that no one out there on the internet can know who they are but anonymity is actually a much, much harder problem to solve. And again, for most of us ordinary people, probably not what you want. There are situations in which even ordinary people might want 
at least a fair degree of anonymity. We'll talk about those in a second. But what we are focus focusing on today is that first category, the privacy. Now, to picture the difference amongst these concepts, I want you to think about a bear. A bear is my all-purpose example of privacy, security, and anonymity. So here's a bear, looks very friendly. I hope this was taken with a telephoto lens. I would not want to be super close to a big bear in real life. Now, a place where I might be kind of close to a bear is at a zoo. And we have a zoo here in Saskatoon that has uh, two or three grizzly bears. Uh, this isn't that. This is a, a zoo in... Uh, this is a much larger zoo, let's just say. But uh, here we have some bears playing. Some of them are in the water. And there is a moat, right? And then there's this big plexiglass barrier. And the visitors in the zoo are beyond that barrier. What we have here is security. By that, I mean the visitors over there on the other side of the plexiglass cannot be harmed by the bears. We are physically safe. We're secure. The, the, the danger over there, we can see it. It can't hurt us. We're secure. Now, for that matter, the bears are also secure from us. If a visitor to the zoo intended some mischief toward the bears, uh, well, they would be they would be safe because we have these physical barriers. What we don't have here is privacy. The bears don't have any privacy from the visitors. The visitors don't have any privacy from the bears as bears as they would care. And the visitors don't have any privacy from each other because we're just all out in the open. We can see the other people. We can overhear their conversations. There's no privacy, but there is security. Now let's flip that. Let's say you go camping and you're out in the woods You've pitched a tent and you're in a really remote location. There, there's nobody around for miles. You would have to hike for an hour to see the next human being. So there you are in your tent, perhaps with a family member or something, and you could have a very, very private conversation. And by private, I mean no one can see you. No one can hear you. That's what privacy is. You can do whatever you do, say whatever you say, and no one knows about it. However, if a bear happened to walk by, what you would not have in this situation is security because a thin piece of nylon is, is no match at all for one swipe of a bear's paw, and you would be a mess of bloody remains. What you would have, however, is anonymity, at least until the medical examiner has uh, has figured out who you used to be based on your dental records or whatever. So out in the woods, you have privacy, but not security. You have anonymity, at least from the bear's point of view, but that anonymity could go away after the fact, all right? So three separate concepts. A bear tells us all we need to know, privacy, security, and anonymity. In terms of those first two, because they are closely related, most of the things that can increase your security increase your privacy too. You think of curtains on the windows. You think of a lock on the door. You think of um, things that will keep out your neighbors, passersby, burglars. Well, those same kinds of things that keep people out also keep them from hearing or seeing what you're doing inside your house. So there's absolutely a relationship there. For what we're doing today, for the, the high tech stuff, the computer and phone and tablet kind of stuff, there are things that are mostly in the security column. Things like this. Password that you use to unlock your computer. If you have full disk encryption of any kind of setup on your device, that's in the security column. Firewalls, anti-malware software. These are things that on your digital devices protect you and your data 
from harm. They protect you from people trying to, uh, you know, disrupt what you're doing, ransomware, things like that. In the mostly privacy column, we have things like E2EE, -E, that's the shortcut for end-to-end -end encryption. If you are using something like WhatsApp or Signal or Apple's iMessage to have conversations with other people, those conversations are encrypted from your device all the way through to the other person's device. That means it's next to impossible not impossible, but very, 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 very difficult for anyone in between to see what is going on in that conversation. Unless, of course, they know the, the password. Web tracker blocking, which we'll be talking about later, also protects your privacy, protects information about what you are doing as you browse the web from getting out to other people. Virtual private networks, again, which we'll talk about later, keep what you are doing from leaking out in various ways. Now, again, there is definitely overlap, but we will be mostly talking about the second column there. So online privacy means a few things. First of all, when you voluntarily submit information, let's say you want to buy, oh, I don't know, an ebook from me, which is a fantastic thing to do. You're going to say, well, here's what I want and here's my credit card number or PayPal or Apple Pay or whatever it is you're using to pay for the thing. Well, you have to provide that information in order for me to get your money and for me to send you your book. I'm gonna to need to know your name. I'm gonna to need to know your email address, all right? So that's great, but that's between you and me or you, know, you and the credit card company, right? So some somehow or other information has to go to a bank <laughs> say yes this person agrees to pay this amount of money for this thing and magic happens and you get the thing and i get the money okay so you're voluntarily submitting that information but what you don't want is for some you know some guy in a striped shirt with uh, uh, you know, a, a mask on hunched over a keyboard to know what your, to know your credit card information, for example. Now there's also accidental, uh, transmitting of information. I have had the experience and I would guess many of you also have had the experience of sending a message, it could be email, could be a text message. And then a minute after sending it, I go, oh. I put the wrong address in there. I sent that to the wrong thread. And uh, maybe it's too late to undo that. So there are a lot of kind of opportunities when using the internet for oopsies where you, uh, you, you do intend to give out information, but you didn't intend to give it to that party. And there are also things like you you think that you are just browsing the web, you think that you're doing a search, you think that you're downloading some software, whatever it is you might be doing, and your perception is that it's just between you and that other party, but what you don't know is that other things are going on behind the scenes and that information is being watched by lots of other people. So that's another thing we want to prevent. And then finally, we want to make sure that people aren't breaking in to our computers and other devices over the internet. This happens. It's it's entirely possible, especially if you download malware that lets someone out there take control of your computer, see what you do, see what you type. If the proper uh, barriers are not in place, then uh, you could lose a lot of private information that way. But then people say, wait a minute, Joe, you're talking about all these ways that private information can get out, but you haven't really told me what the private information is. My life is an open book. I have nothing to hide. And I say, really, you have nothing to hide. Well, uh, could you just, you know, 
give me your credit card number. Just tell me that. Can you tell me your social security number? Can you tell me where you live? Can you uh, recite your medical history to me? And when I say things like that, they go, oh, I guess I do have things to hide. No matter how honest of a person you are and how, how upright of a citizen you are and good for you, we all have things that we want to keep out of other people's hands. Yes, I do want my doctor to know about my medical history, but I don't want random people on the internet to know. Maybe I have a lot of people's addresses and phone numbers in my address book on my computer or my phone or whatever. I need to know that information, but even if I don't care about my own information getting out, maybe I don't care that people know my home address, it could be that all those other people in my address book really, really care. They really don't want anybody else to know where they physically live. So you are not only protecting your own private information, but potentially the private information of other people as well. And there's nothing wrong with this. This is all perfectly normal. Now, who are we hiding this from? Well, potentially a lot of people, but let's start with the biggest and baddest category by far, and that is advertisers. In the 21st century, the internet runs on advertising. Maybe it shouldn't. Maybe this was a bad decision, but it is the way it is. So every, almost every website you visit, videos you watch, music you listen to, even apps you download, a tremendous percentage of that is paid for by ads. If you haven't paid anything to use some sort of product or service, there's a really, really good chance that the way it is getting paid for is with your attention. You know, the old saying, if you're not paying for it, you are the product. Well, this is how that works. The people who are making information available, whether it's a web page or a video or any of numerous other kinds of information, uh, do have to eat. And for those who aren't, you know, starving artists, for those of them who are billionaires and multi, multi, multi billionaires, well, they, they need another 10 mansions and they need to have a fleet of private submarines or whatever. So how are they going to get that? If you're not paying them directly, they're going to get it from advertisers. Now, advertisers want to sell their stuff and that's fine. I have stuff to sell too. They need people to know about the things they're selling. Nothing wrong with that. But Advertisers have figured out that you are going to be more likely to make a purchase if their ads are very, very precisely directed to just those people who will be most interested in that particular thing. So if my 10-year-old kid is watching, you know, silly music videos on YouTube and an ad pops up for an SUV like the kid is not going to buy an SUV. The kid is not going to bug his parents to buy an SUV. That's sort of wasted. If there is an ad for an age-appropriate game, then that might be something the kid would bug the parents for. So advertisers have figured out that the more they can know about you, the more precisely they can target ads at you. And so the ad industry has become a privacy nightmare. Advertisers and the platforms they use for their advertising, like Google's AdWords and uh, you know ads on Facebook and ads in many other places, are all designed to suck up as much information about you as possible so that the people running those platforms can get more and more and more money from advertisers and they get more money from advertisers because the advertisers are making more money because you're more likely to buy their stuff, right? So advertising is a really big problem in terms of your privacy. Now, there are lots of other categories too. Sure, it could be that 
you're applying for some kind of insurance and an insurance company says, well, let me just, let me just check their uh, Facebook page or their blog or whatever, you know, social media. And uh, if, if an insurance company sees that you engage a lot in a lot of risky behavior, they might decide to not insure you, or they might decide to raise your rates because that that is evidence that you pose a higher risk. So there are all kinds of other people who might want your private data for their own reasons. A lot of people are really, really worried about uh, government surveillance and maybe not maybe not the US government, it, maybe it's the Russian government, maybe it's the Chinese government, maybe it's somebody else. It does happen in, you know, my research has led me to believe that those sorts of threats are kind of farther down on the list of what ordinary people need to be worrying about. But yes, there are lots of different entities out there trying to get at your stuff. So what I recommend is developing a strategy that will kind of keep your data from being low hanging fruit. Now, there's actually, there's actually a chapter in my book that's basically what I wish I could tell you. And what I mean is if I could just persuade you to do about four or five things, then we could stop right now, end of the conversation. Your privacy is pretty good, not perfect, but pretty, pretty good because you've dealt with the biggest and most imminent threats. And I'd like to just tell you, I'll just do these things and you'll be good, except that almost all of you will say, uh, no, um, that's, that's, that's a step too far. I can't do that. So here are the things that I wish I could tell you if I thought you would actually do them. First thing on the list is get rid of Facebook, delete your account. Don't post on Facebook. Don't look at Facebook. Don't use Facebook in any way. Facebook, among all the major tech companies, Facebook is absolutely the worst when it comes to sucking up your personal information indiscriminately with complete disregard to your preferences. And I, I can't, I mean, I, I have pages and pages and pages in the book about all the bad things that Facebook does. It's not to say that X, formerly Twitter, isn't bad. It's not to say that Google isn't bad. It's not to say that there aren't other places that are, are bad with your privacy. But Facebook is absolutely the worst. If you use Facebook and you could stop using Facebook altogether, that would help a lot. Then there's Google. Google is a notch or two down from Facebook in terms of how blatantly they disregard anyone's interest in privacy. But Google is a, well, you know, parent company, parent company of Facebook is Meta, parent company of Google is now Alphabet, but almost entirely funded by ads. Hundreds of millions, like billions of dollars, almost all of it coming from ads. When I'm talking about Google, I'm not just talking about going to google.com and doing a web search. I'm talking about all the Google products. I'm talking about YouTube, part of Google. I'm talking about Android, made by Google, and it has Google stuff all throughout it. I'm talking about the Chrome browser, the world's most popular browser. Well, the Chrome browser is pretty much a conduit for Google to suck up as much information about you as, as they can. And there's a whole long list, Google Docs, Google Drive, Google Photos. Google is everywhere and they are everywhere and providing most of these services for free because these, and Gmail, let's, I can't, can't forget Gmail, obviously, because these are all ways that Google can learn more about you to show you more and more precisely targeted ads. Getting rid of just 
Facebook and Google, by which I mean finding alternatives to all of those services that you currently use Google for, could be a massive boost to your privacy. Of course, you should also definitely install a good ad blocker. And I don't think that this is necessarily one of those things that people are going to be resistant to. This might be a thing that even the people who couldn't possibly or feel they couldn't possibly give up Facebook, couldn't possibly give up Google, would still say, well, yeah, okay, I could, I could install a good ad blocker. Thing about ad blockers, and there are many, many, many of them, is that they don't just prevent the annoyance of ads popping up on your screen all the time. Well, that's, that's nice. It's nice to not be irritated by the constant ads. But all of those ads, the vast majority of the ads, come with tracking built into them. So merely by displaying an ad on the screen, the company serving the ad can find out information about you and pass that information along to other companies and watch what you do across different sites, even across different devices. So the more ads you block, the better it will be for your privacy. I also really recommend that you encrypt everything. Now, email, okay? Almost never encrypted. There are ways to encrypt email, but most of us don't use them. And even those of us who do use them sometimes only use them sometimes. And that's because email wasn't designed that way. Email was designed to be open. So you can go to extra special effort to encrypt email, but the person you are communicating with also has to go through that same extra special effort. It's, it's not impossible, but it's complicated. And only those messages between the two parties that have both set up things the same way will be encrypted. We talked about things like, uh, you know, WhatsApp and Signal and iMessage. Those are encrypted means of communication, but SMS is not. Most websites nowadays use TLS or SSL. You know, you get the little lock icon in the address bar, and that means that everything between your device and that website is encrypted. So that's good. It wasn't that way 10 years ago. Now most sites do have that. Most devices have some means by which you can encrypt everything on them so that when they're turned off or asleep and you, you turn them on or wake them up, you have to use a password or a scan of your face or your fingerprint or something to get at that data. So that's great. But I really recommend, to the extent possible, encrypt everything. And finally, I would tell you to just say no. We all see every day alerts popping up on our screens. Such and such an app would like access to your location. Such and such an app wants access to your contacts and your calendars. Such and such an app wants to read this file or do this or this. Hey, that hey, that when you you visit a website, can I send you notifications? Can I do this? Can I do that? Well, what I'm saying is, your default answer to all of those, can I do this, can I do this, inquiries should be no. Now, when you encounter something where an app or a website or whatever does have a legitimate need for a particular type of information, no problem. You can agree to just that, or you can say no, but then later turn it back on in your settings. But don't say yes by default. Say no by default. And honestly, if you did these five things, you get rid of Google and Facebook, and you installed a really good ad blocker and you encrypt everything and you adopt this habit of just saying no, that would, that would improve your online privacy massively. Enough that I could say you're, you're probably in pretty good shape. But if this is a step too far, what you can do is make some one-time changes. Remember what I said earlier, things are always changing. So the settings that you change now might not protect your privacy in the same way tomorrow. Make sure that Google has deleted whatever private data they have accumulated about you so far. And that's really not hard. I have instructions in the book 
you log into your Google account, you go to a certain page, you say, okay, for this category, delete this, for this category, delete that. It's pretty straightforward, but you have to, you have to do it manually. Go to data brokers. Data brokers are companies. Some of them are also credit agencies. There's a lot of uh, overlap there. Some of them don't deal with the credit aspect. They just take all this data about you, the places you've visited online, your where you live, your interests. And they compile these into a huge, huge database. And they will sell that information about you to other companies like advertisers or insurers who really want that for some reason. So there are hundreds of data brokers. They each have their own policy for can you delete information from them? How do you go about deleting information from them? They are hard to do. They make it intentionally very difficult for you to purge your information from them because this is how they make their money. And there are companies that you can hire to go and submit all that paperwork and all that, all those forms to all these hundreds of data brokers for you. It's kind of hit and miss, but whether you pay for it with your time or you pay for it by hiring one of these companies, it's going to cost you something, but it is a way to make sure that less of your personal information is out there. But that's, that's cure. In terms of prevention, what I mostly want you to do is to start being skeptical before you enter anything on a web form, before you send an email, before you send a message, before you have any kind of online interaction, just stop a second and think, what if somebody else knew what I was doing right now? What if somebody else read this email message? What if somebody else saw this credit card number? What if somebody else got in, got any kind of information about me because of what I'm doing right now? Consider, is there an alternative? Could I put less information online? The more thoughtful you are, the more likely you are to protect the valuable stuff. Now, uh, I can see that, uh, that that the time is moving on. <laughs> as as I as I so often do, I'm uh, talking a lot more than I intended to. So I want to just briefly briefly touch on four key privacy areas. Now, in my book, I talk about many many more privacy areas and in a lot more detail. Today, I just want to kind of acquaint you with four specific areas that might be of interest, and. I'm not going to spend 10 minutes talking about each one. Time is short, but I want to say a few words about Apple-specific privacy features, keeping your internet connection private, doing stuff privately on the web, and keeping email private. Now, for those of you who do not own any Apple devices, you can take a two-minute break and uh, make yourself a cup of coffee. For anyone who does have a Mac, iPhone, iPad, or whatever, uh, I just want to mention that Apple is pretty good when it comes to privacy. Not perfect. Not really even close to perfect, but, but pretty good. And the reason Apple is pretty good at privacy is that they make most of their money by selling physical objects and by selling services. So you buy an iPhone, Apple gets money. You buy a Mac, Apple gets money. You pay for you know, Apple TV Plus or Apple Music or any of their numerous services, Apple gets money. Now Apple does have some ads, but ads account for a really, really tiny fraction of Apple's revenue. And Apple has decided that Focusing on privacy could be a selling point for them because they can say, look at this huge list of features that we have that maybe you won't find equivalents for in Apple, in Android, maybe you won't find equivalents for in Windows. Now, not all these, some of these do have analogs and other operating systems, but Apple has a pretty decent privacy story and every one of these features I describe in my book 
And I talk about, is, is it worth it? And are there situations where you shouldn't use it? And exactly how much does this help if you turn this on? And really by simply turning on a dozen buttons or so, you can overcome some of these other things, the, you know, the, the, the malware and the adware and all the different kinds of things that are trying to, to ingest your private information, you can defeat quite a lot of those just by turning on some of these features. So if you are an Apple user, I, I recommend looking into these things and figuring out which ones of them you should turn on. There is usually almost no negative effect to turning these on. Now that last one on the list, lockdown mode, that will involve some inconvenience for you. That is only for sort of much higher risk people or situations. But a lot of these other things, you can turn them on and kind of forget them. And most of the time you won't even know they're there. If you are not an Apple user, but you are, are struggling with privacy issues and you are open to considering a new platform for your next phone or tablet or computer, just kind of just kind of keep in mind that some of these things are baked in and they will make your life that much more private. Okay, moving on to the second category, your internet connection. That is, you have a device. It's, uh, you know, your phone or uh, your computer, whatever. Most of us connect to the internet by way of Wi-Fi. Uh, Ethernet still exists. There are ways of getting hardwired connections. And of course, there's cellular internet connections. But when your device is talking to a Wi-Fi router or it's talking to a cell tower or whatever, almost always there's going to be a wireless aspect to it. And then there's going to be a device that is on the other end. And that device is going to talk to another and another and another until that connection kind of gets out there into the big wide internet. That first link in the chain though, your wireless connection is, is vulnerable. If you do not have Wi-Fi encryption turned on, then it is possible that other people nearby, even like a guy parked in the car across the street or in another room that you can't even see, could get a lot of information about what you're doing online. Now, because SSL slash TLS has become much, much, much more common these days, they probably won't be able to see all the raw data that you transmit or receive with uh, another website. They probably won't be able to read the email that you send and receive, but they will be able to figure out what sites you're connecting to. They will be able to learn some basic information about you. So, uh, if you have your own Wi-Fi equipment, you know, your, your own Wi-Fi network in your home or your business, make sure you turn on WPA or WPA2, WPA3, whatever flavor of it your uh, device supports. And WPA in all of its flavors, again, not perfect. There are flaws. There are ways to hack it. But it's better than not. Even, even a flawed system is better than no system at all. And so what if you have to enter your password, you enter your password once, your device is gonna remember it, and that will help to keep that link in the chain that much more secure. Now, if you don't control your own internet connection, your, your Wi-Fi connection, if you're out in public someplace, you're at an airport, a coffee shop or library, whatever, someplace out there where you don't, don't have that option to set your own password, you might want to consider using a VPN, a virtual private network. You install an app on your device, usually pay a small monthly fee or annual fee, and the, the, the entire internet connection between your device and somewhere out in the internet is encrypted. Now, it's not the entire connection end to end, but at least what it does is protect the information that is being sent and receive between your device and that, you know, that other wireless device on the other end from being intercepted. 
you also want to turn on your computer's firewall. It's a couple of clicks. Might not always help, but will almost never hurt. And you never know, it might keep out just that one particular bad guy that's looking to cause you harm. Now, to illustrate this, let's say you are at the bottom there, you're sitting in front of your computer. Up there in the sky, there's the, you know, there's the cloud, there's various websites and apps and places you want to go. And they're all connected through this complicated web, but eventually they connect to your ISP and your ISP somehow connects to your Wi-Fi router. And then there are the wireless signals between your computer and the, and the, the router. And there are some bad guys there. There's the house next door, the the hackers, the 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 interlopers. All right. Now, in a default situation like this, you'll notice all of those dotted lines are gray. That means that everything is unencrypted, and any of those bad guys out there who have their own Wi-Fi devices can potentially see what you're doing. Now, if we use encrypted Wi-Fi, that is turning on WPA, then you'll notice that all of those signals between you and the Wi-Fi router are encrypted. Now that's not everything because there's still a lot of dotted gray lines, but that does keep out sort of the local attackers. If you use a, a VPN, a virtual private network, your Wi-Fi connection may or may not be encrypted, but it doesn't matter because you have created a secure encrypted tunnel that goes from your device through your router, through the ISP, and all the way to some server out there on the internet. What that means is that several links in this chain are now secure, and there are still places that people could potentially poke in and see what's going on, but there are fewer of them. There are ways to make even more of those lines green. Get to that in a moment. Now, People ask me all the time, what VPN provider should I use? Because I see these commercials, I see these ads, I see these, these review sites. And I'm sorry to say, uh, this is a hot mess. And it's a hot mess because VPN providers, uh, there are certainly some really good legitimate providers out there, but there are a lot, and I mean a lot of shady fly-by-night organizations. And as an example, there, there are literally advertising companies out there who have bought VPN providers and they put up their own VPN review sites, which of course rate the providers that they own the highest. And they're all about collecting your information. They're, they're pretending to keep it safer, but what they're really trying to do is to get your money, either through advertising or through the cost of the VPN uh, providers or both. There are also a lot of uh, VPN providers that even if they're not putting up their own kind of fake review sites, offer people very high uh, affiliate fees. So if just I'm a guy and I make my own website and I'm promoting somebody's service and I want to say, well, I've reviewed uh, five VPN providers and here's my list. I have an incentive to put the highest rating on whichever VPN provider is giving me the, the, the biggest kickback, right? Uh, this happens all the time. So when you go to try to find out what VPN provider should I use, it is almost guaranteed that you're going to run into a lot of these sites that are basically lying to you. They're basically making up stuff to get you to sign up for whatever provider will, you know, produce the most money for them, not the most privacy for you. Now, there are some providers that I have researched extensively. Um, most of them I have tried out myself and I have very good reasons to trust them. It's not to say that something couldn't change in the future, uh, but these are just a few examples of ones that I, I feel good about. I, I feel that they are above board and 
maybe not the fastest, maybe not the cheapest, but I, I will take a little more expensive and a little slower over trying to steal all of my money and um, privacy. But again, don't just trust anyone. Now, if you go to like a site like Wired or or PC World or, you know, like, like a, a legitimate, well-known website, tech, tech website, you can probably reasonably trust their reviews. But if you don't know the website in question, be very, very skeptical. Now, browsing the web privately. Regardless of whether you use a VPN, regardless of whether you use encrypted Wi-Fi, you are going to spend a lot of time looking at a lot of websites. And hey, the fact that you have an encrypted connection between you and some other website, because yeah, there's a little green lock in the, in the address bar, that's great. That does mean the all the data you send and receive with that one site is encrypted, but it doesn't mean that that site is taking care of your private data. That encrypted site could still be sucking in all kinds of stuff about where you've been and what you do and what you like and everything you've clicked on and your browsing history and your search history and passing it on to other sites. So you need more than just that security, you need privacy. In addition, no matter how many switches you flip or how many ad blockers you install or whatever, if you go to a site and then you log in with a username and password, well, that site knows exactly who you are. You are definitely not anonymous. So uh, my first piece of advice is to use a privacy respecting browser. I mentioned Google Chrome a while back. Don't use it. Don't, no, really, don't use Chrome. And I know what you're thinking, but everybody uses Chrome. I love Chrome. I'm used to Chrome. I have extensions that work in Chrome. Chrome is great, except Chrome is out to get you. Now, if you need a Chrome compatible browser, one that's built on the same underlying engine, there are lots of choices. There's Arc, there's Vivaldi, which is what I use. Um, there, there, there are actually a whole bunch of them, but don't use actual Chrome Chrome. You can get all the same features you want without using Chrome. You use some other browser that's like Chrome and don't log into your Google account there because again, Google, but you can get all those features with a browser that respects your privacy a lot more. Now, Brave is another example of a Chrome-based browser that is more secure. I have reasons for not liking Brave. I talk about them in the book. I just wanted to mention that because I know somebody is going to ask. If you're an Apple user, Safari is pretty good, even with default settings. If you change some of the default settings, it'll get even better. But even with those things having been done, you will still definitely want to add an ad blocker to Safari. Disable third-party cookies. Cookies are these little text files on your, on your computer that sites use for some perfectly good reasons, like keeping track of your, your settings, your preferences. In, in the case of our site, you know, you, we have a shopping cart. You want to put a book in your cart and come back later and find that that same book is still there and we, we have to keep track of what you have put in your cart. So cookies really help us out in that way. They make the experience of using the web easier for you. But cookies are also uh, places where the sites you visit can store private information about you. And then another site can go look at that cookie and take that combined information, add it to a big old profile of you. So when it's a cookie that the site you're on is getting, no problem. When it's somebody else's cookie, you know, it's an ad provider setting that cookie and reading that cookie, that's a third-party cookie. That's what you want to avoid. And, and pretty much all browsers have a way to turn that off. Use a browser extension that blocks ads and tracking. Uh, again, I have lots of suggestions in the book as to which ones might be good for your platform. 
Use a password manager. Use something like one password dash lane uh, RoboForm. Uh, Bitwarden. I mean, there's there's so many of them. Use an app to generate strong passwords, to remember them, to fill them in for you automatically. And not just your passwords, but also uh, software licenses, your social security number, uh, health insurance information, anything that is that is private and you want to keep securely encrypted, keep it in your password manager. Web searches reveal a ton of information about you. Now, I, I usually use DuckDuckGo for my own web searches because they don't keep logs of what I search for. They don't, uh, they, they, it's a, it's a, they do have they optional, optional ads, but they're not targeted based on what I searched for. So DuckDuckGo as, web, as free web search engines go is pretty good. Now, Kagi is a web search engine that is not free. It's even better than DuckDuckGo, and it has in common that it protects your privacy. There is a subscription fee involved, but could be worth it for you. Now, if you want to add on to privacy a level of anonymity, websites you visit literally not being able to figure out who you are based on your IP address, based on your, your profile of like your screen size and what fonts you have installed and all the different attributes of your computer, you can try something called Tor, T-O-R. Uh, originally stood for the onion router. It doesn't really stand for anything anymore, but it's a way of, it's kind of similar to a VPN. It makes a secure tunnel, but it routes you through a bunch of random servers that are just like ordinary people's computers all over the world and spits you out at a at a random um, endpoint, that makes it much harder for someone to figure out who you actually are. It makes things a lot slower and it makes browsing a little bit tedious, but it is a way to improve your anonymity. So here we have an example of a website that uses TLS or SSL as it used to be called to encrypt the information between your device and them. And so look, there's a green line all the way from you all the way up to the app or website you're going to. That's great. That whole thing is encrypted. But remember, that's not the whole story. For one thing, even though that connection is encrypted, that site can still see everything you're doing and can still pass that information along to other, other sites and other companies. Secondly, just because I have a secure connection with one particular site does not mean that my email is also protected and this other app is protected. The other things I'm doing on my computer are protected. It's good for what it is, but it's incomplete. Now, if I were using Tor, Tor uh, comes usually by way of a sort of customized version of Firefox browser. You again have that green line, but instead of going up to one specific server out there in the cloud that is owned by like a VPN company, it pings around to a bunch of different uh, other people's computers in who are also using Tor, and that helps to anonymize where you're coming from. Now, these these endpoints are called exit nodes. I gotta, I gotta warn you that some of those exit nodes nodes are run by uh, the FBI. Some of them are run by foreign governments. Uh, some of them are run by bad guys. Okay, so you are you are taking a calculated risk. You might end up with an exit node that uh, that knows something about. You. But still, it is a way to increase your odds of anonymity. Finally, a few things about email. Uh, honestly, email <laughs> was 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 never meant to be encrypted. So if you have something really sensitive to talk about with somebody else, consider not using email. Consider an encrypted messaging system or even a phone call could be more secure. Or how about an in-person discussion? Something like uh, FaceTime or another uh, video, you know, using Skype or some some similar kind of app will give you 
improve privacy and security over email. There are ways to encrypt your email. And there are also ways of just sending an encrypted file. Like I have information that I want to send you. I'm going to, you know, make a zip file and I'm going to put a password on that. So I send you the, the encrypted file and then I use some other means, not email, maybe a, a phone call or an encrypted message or something to give you the password to unlock that. Even if you do this, you have to keep in mind that, you know, I have my secret plan for taking over the world and I've sent it to a friend of mine and that friend receives it securely and nobody else in between me and, and the friend has seen it. And then uh, the friend prints it out and puts it up on a public bulletin board. Well, not private anymore, right? So you can't, you can't control what the other party does. Maybe the other party had their computer hacked. Maybe the other party has some malware or, or whatever that is allowing that information to get out. Even though that connection may be secure, it's not really controlling the information. So you have to keep that risk in mind. But I want to wrap up by asking whether you're worrying about the right things. And I want to just, excuse me. I want to tell you about my Aunt Gail. My Aunt Gail lived a uh, half a dozen blocks away from me when I was growing up. And she was one of the most paranoid people I ever knew. She lived in a very small, very uh, dingy looking house in, uh, you know, a pretty uninteresting neighborhood. And she was terrified, just completely terrified that someone would break into her house and I don't know why, because no one would really have any particular reason to harm her and she didn't have any money or any valuables, but she was, she was terrified that someone would break into her house and cause her some kind of harm. So she put about six or eight locks on her front door. This is not an actual photograph of Aunt Gail's front door, but it, it's, it's the same kind of idea. And she thought that these locks would protect her. Well, no one literally ever did try to break into her house, but what would happen is anytime I would come over to visit or another family member, mail carrier comes with a package or, or whatever, she would say, oh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, she'd look out the window, make sure it's somebody she's doing it. Now I got to unlock these doors. I'm having trouble with this one. It'd take her five minutes to undo all these locks. Finally, we'd be able to get in. So it caused her inconvenience cause the visitors inconvenience. And what I worried about on my Aunt Gail's behalf was, well, she's, you know, she's kind of old, has some health problems. What if she falls and breaks her hip? What if she gets sick and can't get up? And she could call 911, but then the people that come have to deal with this. Maybe there's a fire in her house. That is a legitimate concern. Very old house could burn. How are the firefighters going to get in to rescue her? So this is, again, one of those things where security, like privacy, cuts both ways. The things that she perceives as keeping her safer could actually make her less safe, and they're definitely causing her inconvenience. I could tell you other stories, but this would be an example of worrying about something that you really don't need to worry about. So some of the things in, in terms of online privacy that I think you really don't need, okay, some things that most people probably don't need to worry about too much because again, there are those people out there that have exceptional privacy needs. Some of those things are getting stuff for free. Oh, well, I don't wanna pay to read this article. I don't wanna pay to do a web search. I don't, my, my top priority in life is to not pay for anything. That's what's most important to me. And I'm really worried about protecting my money. Well, you know, you get what you pay for. So if your top priority in life is getting things for free, I just want to let you know that the cost for free is your privacy. That it is literally how it works. What you get for free is paid for 
by giving out information about yourself. So don't worry about the fact that you might have to spend a few bucks to legitimately get some information or some product or service. It's probably going to be worth it in terms of your privacy. Don't worry about the guy with the mask hunched over the keyboard, right? Sure, there are guys like that out there. But unless you personally have some really, really secret data that they might be interested in, or you know, you you have a lot of money or a lot of influence or a lot of power, we're talking about lottery-like odds for getting personally hacked. I've had people say, well, I don't, I don't trust the cloud. I don't want to keep anything in the cloud because the cloud feels very open and public and unsafe to me. Uh, you shouldn't worry about that because almost all cloud providers, whether you're talking about something like uh, uh, Dropbox or Apple's uh, iCloud Drive or places that not only just store um, files, but also, you know, photos and email and contacts and calendars and things, all the different cloud providers, the vast majority of them keep your information securely encrypted, both while it's on your way between your computer and the cloud in the other direction, and while it's up there in the cloud, which really just means on somebody else's computer somewhere. As long as your stuff is encrypted, it doesn't matter whether it's on a hard drive or an SSD that happens to be, you know, on your desk or whether it's on some server in another state or another country. It's secure as long as it's encrypted. Don't worry about malware. I'm not saying that malware doesn't exist. It absolutely does. It can be really, really nasty. It's not a bad idea to install some anti-malware software on your computer. But if you stay away from the sites that are the most likely, the most common vectors for malware, if you stay away from porn sites, if you stay away from sites that, that offer pirated software and pirated music, movies, stuff like that, if you stay away from the sites that kind of cater toward, you know, um, illegal things or or at least um, highly suspect things, then you massively decrease the possibility of getting malware on your device. Somebody sends you a link in email or by a text message. If you don't know the person, if you aren't sure you know where that link came from and that it's legit, well, don't click it because clicking unknown links from unknown places is a very, very common cause of getting malware. So what I'm saying is it's not that it doesn't exist. It's not that it's not a problem, but don't worry about it. Just be smart about it. Don't worry about apps popping up things on your computer saying, uh, I, I want access to all the files in this folder, almost all the time, if it's an app from a legitimate source that you've intentionally installed and it says it wants access to a particular folder or place on your computer, almost always that's legit. Of course, you can come up with counter examples, but this is not something you should lose sleep over. I have people saying, well, I don't wanna just use a good password when I sign up for a new account. I also want to disguise my email address, use a username that isn't my name, that, that's some obfuscated thing. Well, you can, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but you shouldn't think that using the right username is going to protect you and that using your personal name is going to put you at risk. That's just not how things work. That is not something you should worry about. Private browsing or incognito mode, depending on your browser. These don't do what most people think they do. They don't protect your information from other websites. All they do is keep your device from keeping a from making a local record of the places you visited. So if you want to go to a certain website 
And you want to make sure that someone who later looks at your browsing history on your computer doesn't know that you went to that website. Well, that would be an example of what a private browsing mode would do. Doesn't keep the website from keeping a record of that. Doesn't keep DNS providers and your ISP and other parties along the way from knowing what you did. It really is just for that purpose of keeping your computer or other device from storing a record of what you've done. So usually kind of not worth it. Some things you do need to worry about more are, and again, I have many, many pages about this in my book, Facebook and the other meta brands like Instagram, sorry, uh, they are really a very significant threat to your privacy. I recommend avoiding them. Same thing for Google, Chrome, Android, etc. Do worry about your passwords. Mentioned that before, mentioned it again. Every single site you visit should have its own long, strong, unique password. A password manager can handle all that for you. And it's a really great idea. Anytime you have the option to turn on two-factor authentication, do it because that puts another barrier between uh, the bad guys and you. Anytime you have the option to use end-to-end -end encryption, use it. Last but not least, back up your stuff. Back up your computer. Back up your mobile devices because... A lot of the kinds of damage and mischief that the bad guys can cause assume that you don't have backups <laughs> and you can undo a lot of damage simply by restoring data from a backup. I want you to take away one last thing that is my motto. You know how uh, there's, this, there's this motto in Las Vegas, what happens in Vegas? stays in Vegas. Well, I have kind of my own version of that. And that is what happens on the internet stays on the internet. By this, I mean, once you have exposed some piece of data to the internet, whether that's sending an email or entering something in a web form or whatever it may be, you can never know that that information is gone has been deleted. You can ask a company or a site to delete data, but you don't know that they have. You don't know that they don't have a backup. You don't know that somebody didn't take a screenshot of that post on social media. Just because you deleted it doesn't mean it's not still out there. Potentially, anything you ever exposed to the internet could be out there someplace forever and could come back to haunt you. So if you don't want to have any risk of a thing coming back to haunt you, be very, very careful what you put on the internet in the first place. So I talked for quite a long time, sorry, uh, but if you'd like to read vastly more detail about this, um, uh, this slide, I'm sorry, I forgot to update it. Uh, it actually, the, the fifth edition is out. It That was you know, later this month was a few months ago. So it is out now. It's uh, quite detailed and will help you no matter what kind of device or devices you're using. I hope you will take advantage of it. And at this point, <laughs> if, if you're still with me, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen here. And, uh, oops, put the wrong thing. Stop share. There we go. And ask if there are any questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you for your patience. That was a great job. Uh, Judy has a couple of questions that came through the chat box. And uh, if anybody else has further questions, uh, put those in the chat box for Judy, because we're not going to do an open uh, Q&A time uh, at this time, because we're going to move on as soon as Judy has the questions that were sent up. So um, if you have questions for uh, Joe, who probably has to get back to work, uh, put them in the chat box, she'll email them to him, uh, and then we will take care of the two that she has or so, and then we'll be <coughs> moving on. Uh, I have to say, 
That was absolutely a fantastic presentation. I was just so, thank you, Leah, for agreeing. I love that. But it was absolutely incredibly interesting, as I know our next presentation will be. And as I said in my email, we are going to be so inundated and will absorb all of this information. We should be the most private people out in the world when we are using our various and sundry apps and email and things like that. And I know John's laughing because I'm a, Google, a Chrome person and he's and I always say, and John will say, use DuckDuckGo. Well, I think Judy's going to bite the bullet and finally change over. But I have a a few questions here that I am going to ask. And uh, are there any plans to offer the Take Control books uh, on Audible? No, there, there, there are no plans to do that. Um, audiobooks are like, I, I, I love the idea of audiobooks. Audiobooks are great for things like novels and history books. Um, for, for tech books like ours, um, we have dozens, sometimes hundreds of, of places in the book where you can't, uh, like we have a, we have illustrations and we say, okay, yeah, yeah, click, click this icon or do this thing in this dialogue that's, that's, uh, that's highlighted and you can't convey that stuff audibly. Furthermore, our books are very frequently updated. So uh, for someone to have to re-record a great chunk of a book or maybe an entire book every few months is just kind of, it's it's too much. It's too much. So uh, although I, I love the idea of audiobooks, um, the kinds of books we do are not a good fit for audiobooks. And it would be a tremendous expense on our part for not a great experience for you. Sorry. Thank you. And if you do buy the book, you receive a copy free of every single update. Uh, well, I have, to, I have to qualify that. I, oh, I, have okay. to, I have to qualify that. So if we, we have sort of different different types of updates. So you know how like you, you, you get an app. All right, and it's version 5.0. And then, uh oh, a couple of weeks later, there's a version 5.0.1 because the developers found some bugs. And then like six months later, there is a version 5.1 because they decided to add one little feature. And then a year or two later, there's version six because we have a new user interface and a new big things. Okay, so it's kind of the same way with our books. The smaller updates are free, but if I spend a couple of months writing a massively revised new edition, I am going to ask for an upgrade fee. Now it'll be cheaper, much cheaper for someone who already owns the book. Maybe, you know, you paid, as an example, maybe you paid $15 originally and the new edition is $5 or something like that. But, uh, so we don't say all updates are free forever, but the smaller, more minor updates are free and the bigger like new editions are heavily discounted. Thank you. Uh, Apple discontinued the Airport Extreme base station. What would you recommend for a replacement router? Uh, here in my home, I use Netgear Orbi routers. Uh, they're, it's a mesh system, so you can have a bunch of them in different places, and they talk to each other. And they, uh, they, you know, I've I tried many, many different routers from lots of different manufacturers, and. Um, what I, I I personally like the Orbeez, and there are you know numerous different models of them, ranging from pretty cheap to mind-boggling mind-bogglingly expensive. Um, there are the Eero routers, which are the same kind of things, a mesh network. Uh, so uh, the you know the Orbeez is, is my personal pick because I've found that to be reliable, to have the features I need, and to have the coverage I need from my house. Um, I have not by any means done an exhaustive review of dozens or hundreds of, of uh, Wi-Fi routers. I'm sure there are plenty of others that are absolutely fine. Um, I, in my, my personal experience, I would go with a mesh network. And if I had to pick one 
mesh network that I've had good experiences with, that would, that would be the Orbi. Thank you. And how safe are Chrome laptops? We just received free laptops at Leisure World. That's over here with me in Orange County. Yeah, well, I mean, I didn't I didn't mention Chromebooks in the list of Google products, but obviously it's uh, it's on the list. You can't really use a Chromebook without logging into a, a Google account and you're going to use Google for, you know, storing information. You're going to probably do uh, most of your work in in apps like Google Docs and Google Sheets and and so forth. Uh the reason Chromebooks exist is not for your convenience. It's for another way for Google to make money from your private data. I'm, I'm really sorry. Like I, I, mean, I have kids that use Chromebooks at school too. They can't help it. That's what's there. And I get that they're really cheap and they're really cheap because the money is coming from someplace else. So uh, I would never, ever ever buy a Chromebook. I would never recommend a Chromebook to somebody who has a choice. If your school organization, whatever, has them and you have to use them, you have to use them. Uh, do the best you can to lock down privacy settings, install some ad blocking extensions, those sorts of things, and where you have the option to use some other service besides Google, store your data and some other data and some other location option. Um, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. Outstanding. Thank you so much. I really appreciate every single thing we all learned today. I always say if you learn one new thing, it's worth it. I'm sure we all learned a heck of a lot more than just one thing today.